So we are now uh, in a new session, a new panel on another critical topic. Again, our, our forum aims to showcase the thought leadership of Greek shipping, Greek ship owners being the largest uh, owners in the world. Uh, they obviously have uh, very strong uh, uh, positions in terms of thinking, in terms of their approach to critical industry topics. And one of those critical topics is fleet renewal. Obviously, uh, you know, you, you are building a ship, the ship has a long-term life, but fleet renewal and keeping a modern fleet is always at the forefront. And today, uh, with everything happening in the world, the question of fleet renewal and technology is a, and, and building the ships of the future is a particularly complicated and particularly relevant topic. So we have with us four major principles, and uh, we have uh, Knut uh, uh, Orbeck Nielsen, the um, CEO of DNV GL Maritime. So Knut is going to moderate the panel, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us. And Knut, I turn over the floor to you, and thank you to John, Philippos, uh, Tony, and uh, Alexander. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Knut Orbeck Nielsen. I'm the CEO of DMVGL Maritime, and I'm very happy to be your panel host here today. Um, a quick and firm thank you to you, Nicholas, for inviting me here today and for your tireless efforts in organizing these incredibly valuable events at Capital Link. Now, our panel, as Nicholas mentioned, will lend their collective expertise to the topic of fleet renewal, building the ships of the future. And uh, before we get started, allow me to introduce to you what I believe is a top class lineup of uh, speakers. So we have Mr. Filippos Phillis, the CEO of Lemisol and Navigation. He's also the vice president of the European Community Ship Owners Association. Dr. John Kustas, at the CEO of Danaos Corporation, Mr. Tony Larritsen, the CEO of Dynagas LNG Partners, and last but not least, Mr. Alexandros Panagopoulos, the founder and CEO of Forward Ships. So, dear panelists, I'm really grateful that you can be with us and discussing this topic today. Uh, it is a shame that the pandemic still prevents us from meeting face to face, but I guess we are all by now getting quite used to meeting virtually. Uh, and I must say it's great to have you here. Greece, as we all know, is steeped in a maritime tradition dating back thousands of years. And it is a strategically significant nation for trade nestled against the crossroads of the world with Europe, Asia, and Africa all within reach. Now, I would first like to begin by praising the Greek ship industry for its enduring pioneering spirit. I'm constantly amazed by the scale, the quality, and the innovativeness of the Greek fleet. I would also like to thank you for your tireless commitment to the course of the seafarers, a course very close to my heart. And given your prominent role in the world of shipping, your support continues to be critical for those still facing a very uncertain future. And so without further delay, let us begin uh, with the panel uh, discussion. Now, in last week's Global Maritime Forum, some participants got a little bit ahead of themselves and um, provided some comments that advocated viewpoints that went contrary to the interests of international shipping. And it is my view that regionalism, localism, and nationalism are all a real dead end when it comes to tackling global problems like the climate change. Now, with an average age of just 12.6 years, the Greek fleet is one of the youngest in the world. What steps have you taken with respect to your companies to ensure that your fleet is future-proofed against increasingly stringent environmental regulations? And to start off, I would like to go first to you, Philippos, and then uh, to John, please. Uh, thank you, Knut. 
um, the fleet re renewal was a strategic move for some time now. It was clear that the new technical and environmental regulations coming into effect would allow only uh, the fittest to survive. Within our group, uh, it was uh, therefore imperative to utilize all internal resources and also to build around the necessary uh, capabilities to redesign and optimize the ships to be built. Of course, using the existing technologies available, but also to introduce some new innovative ideas to create more efficient uh, ships that will be able to withstand uh, the competition and also to satisfy the needs of the environmental regulations, plus, uh, our, of course, our charters. A, a very difficult and ambitious goal, though. Uh, as a group, we said from the beginning two main targets to be achieved. Uh, the first target was to analyze all equipments on board, going from main engine, going down to the smallest equipment that consumes energy, and even up to the cranes. The reason behind of this analysis was first to assess the way how to reduce energy consumption, and secondly, to make sure uh, that the selection of the proper and fit machinery will contribute uh, towards uh, maintaining reduced OPEX in the long run, of course. Uh, the second target uh, was to optimize the propulsion, the hull, uh, study the wind resistance, as well as developing uh, based on the existing uh, energy saving devices, our, our own tailor-made fit for our hulls. Uh, to, achieve, to achieve those several, uh, several model tests have been performed to measure uh, the individual performance plus the combined and the, at the end. Uh, this exercise uh, led uh, to the substantial reduction of the EDI. Uh, having achieved uh, these, the, the ships today uh, and recently our new builds uh, recently uh, receive a, a significant premium on freight compared with the peer group. So the two targets uh, were to have as low as possible OPEX and to receive premium on the revenue, uh, which give us with this way a better uh, margin. All above uh, contributed actually to develop uh, a comprehensive ship design with the highest specs. Uh, and, and that uh, at this moment has the lowest EDI of the tire pair group, uh, fulfilling even the phase three and belongs maybe to the 0.2% of the ships in the water at this moment that managed to reach uh, the phase three. Uh, nevertheless, the, the know-how and technologies av available today are not sufficient to future-proof against increasingly uh, stringent uh, environmental regulations. We are on continuous research mode to improve uh, further the efficiency and uh, consequently to reduce the carbon footprint of our print. Uh, yet uh, the remaining margin obviously with existing technology becomes less and less. Uh, all mentioned so far are only technical measures. Uh, our group, though, invested uh, over this period heavily towards developing tools uh, that are made available to the commercial operation department, uh, also the technical department, offering the shore assistance of the crew to uh, specifically for optimizing uh, their routes and preventing eventual any, any damages. Uh, we have developed, for example, a real-time uh, performance monitoring system uh, with which the shore team could any time intervene and guide the crew when the vessel underperforms uh, during sailing. And a second important tool uh, is the route optimization system, which uh, uses uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning language to calculate every route uh, and every couple of hours uh, renewing the calculation because of the weather, uh, the real time weather, uh, to um, estimate the best possible route. Uh, offering with this uh, a comprehensive advice to the captain on board, assisting practically then decision making, and in particular during adverse uh, weather conditions. Uh, the system achieves a theoretical uh, reduction of about 7.5 percent. It's very difficult, though, to calculate unless you have uh, a lot of data to analyze. 
Uh, as a further step, any parallel to these developments, uh, we, all, we, all, we have been always keep an eye on the, on the valuations. At the right time, we dispose of the, uh, the altered tonnage. And I mean uh, altered tonnage, those ships that uh, they, they cannot even fulfill the phase zero at this moment of the EDI. Concluding, uh, there is a great uncertainty into the future uh, environmental regulations and with regional measures announced around the world and uh, uh, EU uh, is being among uh, these examples, it makes it even harder to predict uh, what is coming and how a ship built today will be future proof uh, for, uh, from upcoming environ environmental regulations. It is unfortunate that the EU wishes to assist and decarbonize the industry and announce uh, uh, this uh, 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 through the Green Deal. However, does not provide the regulatory certainty and necessary settings to support this transition. And in contrary, uh, EU is about not to introduce uh, the ETS as a regional measure for which we oppose and we doubt that such a measure will contribute towards reduction of the emissions. Of course, this uncertainty is reflected uh, at the today's uh, order book, uh, where the owners are skeptical if an investment of today will make a business case in 20 years and if the technologies available to today will be those uh, prevailing 10 years down the line, for example. Um, that's all from my side at this moment. That was, uh, thank you very much, Philippus, for, sh for sharing your insights and what you have done. And it, it's quite comprehensive measures already taken, uh, encouraging also to see that you, you can get some benefits on the, on the rate side. Uh, that is encouraging. Uh, John, can I turn to you, please? And maybe you could uh, add your views and insights to this uh, topic, please. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, uh, first of all, uh, we have concentrated on, uh, uh, let's say, attaining uh, the carbon reduction goals on the operational front. Uh, it's not easy uh, to, you know, to build a completely new fleet, especially uh, when the, today there are no let's say, breakthrough technologies that are going to decarbonize shipping. We might have some marginal increases, uh, but this cannot really justify massive new building investments. So uh, what is really what we can do is to concentrate on uh, the operational aspects. And of course, uh, the, uh, this uh, includes uh, retrofits that we have retrofitted about a third of our fleet uh, with uh, bulbous uh, bow, uh, a new bulbous bow that uh, optimizes the new speed uh, profile. Uh, on uh, a significant number of ships, we also optimize the propeller. Uh, we are using uh, low friction paints vessels. Uh, we have, of course, uh, for from a very long time, uh, uh, full real-time monitoring of performance on board and optimizing and all the weather routing. I mean, that we've been doing for at least the last uh, six, seven years. And uh, it's already pretty mature in uh, the culture of uh, the company. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we are, in terms of, let's say, meeting carbon targets, as these relate to speed, uh, we are practically at the hands of our charters. So it's, if we are directed to go at a higher speed, then because there is nothing, uh, we will have an increased uh, carbon footprint, which has nothing to do with uh, our own uh, decision making uh, efforts. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have been, we have produced a report that uh, shows the overall carbon intensity of the fleet from 2008 until today. And uh, actually we have, uh, this report is in uh, also on our website. 
And uh, uh, we have achieved through a combination of larger vessels, new buildings in the fleet at the time, uh, uh, slower speeds and energy savings measure, we have achieved the 40% carbon intensity reduction as per fleet already in 2020. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a very interesting uh, feast and uh, we're very proud of that. And uh, of course, we're looking at future technologies, but uh, as I said, uh, shipping is about, if, if we take, let's say the overall transportation energy consumption, shipping is about 15% of that. And uh, it's very difficult for shipping to devise, uh, let's say, fuels that are uh, carbon neutral uh, without the help of the shore uh, organization and shore infrastructure. So to a certain extent, we'll have to wait to see where the uh, shore transportation is going to move in order to see, I mean, for all these technologies, where we're going to move uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you John. And, um, congratulations on uh, your achievements already. Um, so we heard that um, a lot uh, can be done on the existing fleet and uh, achievements have already uh, been made, which is very encouraging. Now for the, for the next uh, question, I would like to turn to you first, Tony, and then to, to Alex. So uh, turning then to the new building, so less uh, than 1% of the existing world fleet are running on uh, alternative fuels and less than 10% of the current new builds uh, on order are with alternative fuel systems. Beyond uh, regulations, uh, what incentives would encourage you to invest in greener ships and embrace uh, alternative fuels? And Tony, please, could we hear from you first, please? Absolutely, Knut, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, as a company, we have always been uh, self-motivated to invest uh, in and embrace viable technology that is safe and uh, financially sustainable. Um, I think I'll answer the question a little bit broader. Um, uh, you know, from an, from an industrial point of view, the shipping sector has you know, contributed uh, tremendously to uh, reducing emissions up to this point. Now, this, uh, you know, the incentive was largely financial uh, because less consumption means less cost, but it also means uh, less emissions. Um, so that kind of went hand in hand. Um, now, going forward, when we're talking about alternative fuels, um, um, we're looking at the opposite of that. We're looking at a, a substantial cost increase, uh, cost which is uh, coming from uh, the propulsion, you know, the propulsion system itself, uh, from the uh, from the fuel handling system, uh, to uh, increased operating cost. You will need a different set of people to operate uh, these carriers, to uh, increased GNA because you will have um, a different set of people in your organization ashore too. Um, and of course, there is you know there is training. There is the potential of reduced uptime, etc. Um, so, uh, so the question is, you know, going forward, you know, how, how is the industry and how we're going to deal with that? And I think that depends on the shipping sector that you're in to a large extent. Um, um, for example, if you're in, if you're in bulkers or tankers, um, um, you know, and uh, um, executives and stakeholders have said that, you know, uh, peak coal has passed, uh, peak oil was, was last year. Um, and then when you look at the actual demand side, uh, which is, you know, the demand is, is, is originated by the charters, they formulate the demand for the ship and the service that they want. So um, I don't think we can say that we've seen to a large extent that 
uh, you know, big oil, for example, is, is chartering in and uh, seeking to charter in to a large extent uh, LNG propelled or LNG fueled, um, uh, uh, you know, tankers, you know, in the long term, that will yield a reasonable uh, return on investment to the owners. Um, so, um, so then the question is, what then is the incentive? Is the incentive to kind of follow down the alternative fuel route or is the alternative in the falling trade uh, simply to stay for now as we are? Um, uh, when there are uh, less cargo around, uh, there will be um, uh, you know, more slow steaming, which, which in turn will reduce emissions going forward to a large extent. Now, we do not believe as a company that oil has peaked and we do believe that, you know, that um, there is a, um, uh, uh, you know, it's important with, you know, to investigate and embrace alternative fuels. We think that, you know, that will make a difference going forward, but we need the support uh, of the chartering community. Um, um, now, um, you know, some sectors are, you know, are in a different space and have a, you know, different outlook, for example, the container side, uh, which we're not involved in, but that has a different set of end users, which keeps a uh, you know, different social responsibility profile, which are concerned with the transportation element. Um, and of course, for LNG shipping that we're in, we believe it has decades of growth uh, going forward because there is no other fuel at the moment um, that, that, that really can run in parallel with renewables and with alternative systems. Um, in a scalable way to make sure that industry, you know, uh, you know, keeps on going uh, as, you know, uh, as it is. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I really believe that, you know, the incentive and the self-motivation to invest in uh, alternative fuel, it really depends on which industry that you're in. Um, that being uh, said, um, uh, what I do find is that, you know, shipping is full of extremely qualified, capable people, and given the chance, uh, you know, in a financially sustainable way, I'm sure that most ship owners would embrace uh, newer technology. Great insights, uh, Tony. And uh, with a little help from our friends, the charters, we could also uh, accelerate this uh, process. Alex, uh, could you share your views, please? Sure, thank you, Knud. Uh, so, in each, uh, incentives and disincentives is what is uh, needed here. Pull and push, essentially. So all the initiatives, as uh, Michael Parker said uh, in the uh, Global Maritime Forum, uh, IMO's 2050, uh, Poseidon principles, the Sea Cargo Charter, the EU's uh, carbon trading scheme, all of these initiatives <laughs> essentially create the demand for uh, emissions data. And this emissions data is going to become, as he very correctly pointed out, a new currency by which investment worthiness will be measured. So each day that passes, the world demands more and we, all, we are all witness to it. And uh, with it, all the Gretas uh, out there are uh, coming out with more uh, banners uh, uh, pressuring everybody. Um, I don't know about all of you, but uh, uh, in this COVID pause where uh, we're all stuck uh, where we are, I personally enjoyed the uh, quietness and the uh, crystal clear skies, uh, which were free of uh, jet wash. And uh, I feel that just by the force of evolution, we will see more regulations that eventually may turn this uh, small 10% uh, to become 90%. In uh, where we are today, we're, um, we're well down the road from the 2008 baseline. And uh, obviously there must be a, a very pragmatic chronology, a timeline to achieve a more sustainable decarbonized future for shipping. The, um, the global deep sea fleet, as we all know, consists of more than 60,000 vessels. And uh, the average life expectancy is 25 years. So this fleet cannot be turned around overnight, obviously. Uh, so the path to uh, 2030 and 2050 
essentially dictates that we as an industry take radical steps to decarbonize our future with essentially immediate effect, contrary to what I said before. IMO, the creditors, the charters are all pushing us, ship owners, by making our life progressively more challenging by the day. Uh, however, it seems that there is still no one out there that will pay adequately more for a greener ship, uh, the cost of uh, the capex that you need to incur. And this is what, what is hindering us. Rather, what we see is efforts in particular by the charters, it seems, to uh, rather pay less for the 90% conventional ships. Even more, I would add that our reality today uh, calls for the until recently unheard of situation where we have to prepay and fill up our ships with fuel uh, on behalf of the charters for bunkers to ensure compliance so that then the charters can give preference to our ship. It's, it's a very challenging environment. Thank you, Alex. It's challenging indeed. And, and what you say that uh, so far the charters are not really paying a premium for the more environmental friendly solutions, which is naturally a challenge when that comes with an additional cost. Now, um, on, on this next question, I would like to start with you, John. So, you know, I have uh, quite long uh, advocated the installation of dual fuel LNG engine as being a robust choice for today. It's practical, it's uh, well known, and enabling future flexibility for vessels. Uh, but while LNG is a good strategy for the midterm, and that midterm might be quite long, uh, it will not ensure compliance in the longer term. And um, my question is then, what fuels and technologies do you envisage the next generation of your vessels being propelled by? Uh, as I said before, uh, it's, this is, it's not something that uh, shipping can take the initiative ahead, for example, of the land infrastructure. Uh, and if, let's say, in the end, uh, I mean, shipping theoretically, uh, if we were uh, not concerned about, let's say, cost, theoretically, we could produce from renewable energy, hydrogen, and then from hydrogen, hydrocarbons, which we could burn in our existing engines. Uh, that is a rather inefficient process at present. So, uh, if, for example, uh, we are using, uh, we find some, uh, let's say, other technologies in producing kind of uh, uh, zero carbon uh, fuels, uh, through uh, some other kind of breakthrough process, then uh, fine. On the other hand, if, for example, uh, we see the world moving into hydrogen, for example, then uh, with, let's say, 10 years' time with the development in fuel cells, it will, it's more efficient to use hydrogen directly in a fuel cell rather than using the hydrogen to produce a hydrocarbon and then burn it in a combustion engine. So I'm telling you all this because uh, all here uh, we cannot take the initiatives as shipping and build an infrastructure that will support carbon free vessels, because it's not up to us to manufacture the, uh, the fuel. I mean, and that is why exactly where we can intervene and what we can do is at least to try and minimize 
the power that is required or the energy better that is required to move cargo from point A to point B, because this is really where our expertise lies. And then once people can produce, uh, uh, let's say, a better a carbon free fuel, we will of course adapt our propulsion systems accordingly. At present, the problem is that we do not have clarity on the fuel. It's not about developing a technique or something. And we know and everybody, for example, they are uh, experimenting uh, with uh, ammonia uh, engine, which is a relatively straightforward thing. It's, it's not something, I mean, we've been handling ammonia with compressors, etc., and then using it uh, also in a combustion engine is a process that has been done. Of course, it needs work, but uh, the problem today is that even if, let's say, tomorrow we have one of the big manufacturers saying, okay, that's your engine, where's the fuel? And it's not an issue, uh, for example, because some people are saying, ah, you know, you had the same problem in 2020. Uh, you've put a target, uh, and uh, everybody said that you will not be able to have enough fuel, but then the market adjusted itself. Yeah, but the difference is that over there, there was a very clear uh, technology required, and we knew as a fallback, we could live with blending. Whereas here, it's a completely uh, you know, new world. We don't have any fallback if we move into one direction. If I build a ship, you know, to, to run on hydrogen, I must have hydrogen. I don't have any other means to produce it. So, I mean, we should be, uh, as an industry, we should be able to communicate that it's not our task to produce the fuel. Once there is clarity on what fuel is, can be used and people are building for the land infrastructure that, uh, for that type of fuel, then we can see uh, what will happen in shipping. But exactly, rather than waiting, because these are kind of longer term objectives, what we can do is to create, uh, let's say, operational measures that are reducing carbon. And like, for example, the, uh, the proposal that uh, has been uh, sent, which has been supported by you know, Greece and Japan and some other countries, uh, is definitely in the right direction because it gives, uh, let's say, a roadmap for achieving at least the 40% reduction for 2030 uh, without uh, introducing any uh, dramatic uh, new technologies and fuels which do not exist. Very, very clear uh, views, uh, John. Thank you very much. And, um, and, and clarity on the future fuels and that it is uh, to be provided from, from the land infrastructure side of the shipping community. Uh, can I turn to you, uh, Tony, for some uh, reflections from your side, please? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Knut. Uh, I think it was very well uh, spoken and said by uh, by John here, uh, and we can relate to you know to very much of what was said. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, it, already sitting in you know in the LNG segment, um, when you have uh, you, you know LNG you know, available, you know, in the cargo tank at all times, um, also being the, you know, the, the main alternative fuel that other shipping sectors are looking to. And also given the fact that, um, you know, the industry, the LNG industry has addressed the inefficiency of LNG shipping that used to be there in the past, uh, which would new technology now we've done, let's say a full circle. Um, we are at par in terms of efficiency with, you know, conventional you know, tankers and bulkers uh, using, you know, uh, 
two-stroke engines uh, with the added benefit of, you know, of, um, of burning um, uh, LNG. Um, it took quite a long time and a lot of investment uh, you know, to get there as an industry. Um, there is nothing else uh, uh, clearly in the horizon. Of course, there are things on, the, you know, uh, you know, on a conceptual basis, on an abstract basis, um, that may be turning into reality at some point in time. But when it comes to you know, the, the industry's uh, next steps in terms of ordering uh, and speaking for ourselves, I don't see any other alternative than ordering with a few tweaks the, you know, the, the propulsion um, technology that is, you know, that is there today. Um, going forward, as, a, you know, as John was saying, there is um, you know, thoughts about hydrogen possibly being the most plausible alternative fuel. Um, sitting again in the LNG industry, there is, you know, there's a lot of talk about could one, could one blend in hydrogen into the methane, and therefore, you know, thereby increasing the efficiency of the of the of the of the burning process, and 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 therefore reducing the emissions. This is something that is quite distant, uh, but is being looked at. Of course, in the very far future, I think one is talking about CO2 capture, CO2 reuse together with hydrogen to again create methane that you can that you can use in you know for propulsion but this is um this is way into the future and it's not something that we can you know tackle uh, at this moment uh, apart from being part of the forums that are discussing it and trying to drive things forward uh, but there are a lot of other things that can be done um you know step by step going into uh you know 2050 and for example, there's a, there's a lot of talk about fuel. There's not so much talk about, um, you know, vessels intake. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, each sector look, you know, we look at the, uh, um, you know, the maximum intake that they can, uh, that they can carry for the applicable trade. Um, and for example, in Dynagas, um, we now ordered uh, some time ago, the, the, the largest LNG carriers uh, to date, apart from the Qatari fleet, um, that will um, reduce emission per unit uh, transported. Um, uh, and that has a, a great uh, impact. Um, and um, yeah, um, I, I think that there are many things that can be done apart from just, uh, uh, just on the fuel side. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tony. I, I know that the time is really running away uh, from us, but I would really like to have some quick reflections also from you, Alex, and, and Philip, also, if you have some reflections on this topic as well, that would be great uh, as a sort of the, the final remarks before we have to close this uh, session. So, Alex, please. Yeah, I will very much echo Tony. Uh, I do not see any other realistic or practical choice other than uh, LNG and then a mixture of biogas. Uh, LNG has unrivaled emissions credentials and it's today available. It cuts SOx in particular emissions to negligible amounts and reduces NOx by around 85% and CO2 by up to 21% on a well to weight basis today. So the infrastructure, the availability, the rules and the competitive cost of LNG all point to that. And from an extra CapEx point of view, things are improving all the time. Uh, think of where we were five years ago and where we are today. So we have demonstrated that we can meet and exceed IMO's 2050 emission targets by adding biogas into the fuel mix, which of course, if it becomes 100% uh, biogas, it, uh, it uh, becomes net zero, carbon neutral. And mind you, LNG is the only naturally abundant, uh, abundantly available fuel, not a byproduct not needed to be produced like uh, hydrogen, for example. Uh, and it has the same molecule, whether produced by waste, by the food we eat every day, and then we throw it in the garbage, or synthetically. So there are no blending issues. And uh, we know that getting to absolute zero is the ultimate target, but the fuel and the technology that will get us there has not been invented yet unless we assume that ships will slow down and start sailing, as in sails uh, again, and some like Valenius Marine have indeed sound arguments and proposed just that. 
by the way, with the ocean, ocean bird, the uh, pure carcaria. Right. Thank you, Alex. And, uh, and Philippus, uh, we had more questions as always in these uh, discussions, but time is running fast. And any reflections on your side? Uh, yes, uh, uh, what I can say is that I agree that the infrastructure is not there. And I agree that uh, there will be very difficult uh, to have a solution uh, to, towards a complete carbon neutral uh, shipping. Uh, one example, uh, I mean, extension to what John said before, for example, ammonia production for the consumption of four bar carriers, four Panamaxes a year cost about a billion uh, dollars without taking into consideration uh, that the energy should be uh, also uh, from re renewable sources. So uh, on top of that is a calorific value. I think uh, the efficiency of uh, these alternative fuels so far, maybe are 50% uh, uh, if you compare with the fossil fuels. Uh, very important for me is that there will not be one solution to fit for everything. There will be uh, regional ships driven by hydrogen because the infrastructure will be local. Uh, maybe some deep sea carriers with, uh, with ammonia because they are liners and they have the infrastructure at both ends. And on top of that, uh, we, we have to uh, think on other sources like uh, eventually the development of batteries with uh, better uh, density and, uh, um, and cheaper cost, where this will be a solution for, again, maybe a regional operation or coastal operation. Uh, I think uh, most important is that I don't see in the near future any solution to fit for every purpose. Thank you, Philippos, and, and maybe that's a, a good line to end at, that there's no, not one solution that will fit for everything. Now, gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for your contributions here today, and uh, your expertise and insights are very much appreciated, and I wish you every success in these challenging times, and uh, for sure I look forward to meeting you again soon and continuing the conversation. And... Um, I would wish your, you and your families good health. And uh, I would like to hand it uh, back to you, Nicholas, and thank you again for having us on, on Capital Link. Well, all I want to say is a tremendous thank you. Dynamite discussion, great panel, terrific moderator, but above all, great content. Really, thank you so much. And I think uh, the number of attendees supports what I have said. It's been a, a terrific panel, greatly popular. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Nicolas. Thank, thank you, Knut. Thank, oh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.